years, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, and I'm going to focus on looking at ways that you can protect the data that you've created with your Macintosh so that they are able to be viewed, you know, generations from now. So think about your photos and your text documents and your, your th things that you've created over the course of your life um, that you'd want to pass down. And uh, I'm going to actually just share my screen right now. So, so um, you know, this is something that was kind of top of mind, you know, a few years ago. Um, in addition to being a software developer and, um, uh, you know, working in technology for the for the past 25 years, um, I'm also on the board of a, 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 a group uh, here called the Silicon Valley Computer Genealogy Group. And basically they... Um, they focus on um, computer-based genealogy and family history and things like that. And so what I'm going to share with you guys over the next, you know, half hour, 45 minutes or so is, you know, a derivative of a presentation that I made um, to that group uh, where we talked about um, ways to, you know, allow your, your data that you have now to transition into the next generation. Now, um, you know, this physical digi digital transformation is something that, you know, we've all sort of seen and it's sort of accelerated over the past few years. But for me personally, you know, I, I've worked for Apple several times in my career. And in the mid 90s, I joined the QuickTime team as an engineer. And this was QuickTime was sort of like the very beginning of digital video. And um, for me, you know, I, I had never, um, you know, edited video or edited film the analog way. And so when I started working on QuickTime and I started using things like, um, you know, uh, Premiere, you know, it was like, you know, it, to me, that sort of, that represented the very beginning of, of this. And, you know, if you look at it today, very few people edit video the analog way. And so, so these, these experiences that we've all had over the years um, have sort of given us a few pointers to, to let us know that, you know, um, the, the, the things that we've been used to are changing and they're changing into something that we don't really, it's kind of a question mark as to whether, you know, the data that we create today is going to last a thousand years, like, um, like some documents that we have from, from history. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about is, you know, paper versus data, right? Which is going to last longer? Well, you know, paper, we, we, we know, has a pretty good track record, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's something that uh, you know th that has been sort of the gold standard for you know for history and documentation and and everything. And and now we're twenty five to thirty years into PCs and Macs, and and how do we know that as we migrate away from paper, that you know, hundred years from now, this data is still going to exist? Um, you know, what data is going to exist? Is it going to exist in the same way? And, um, you know, along the same topic, I, I um, about 20, 25 years ago when my father died, um, you know, I received a box of all his stuff, right? I had, um, you know, his, his, his Pan Am personnel file, his, um, you know, all the papers that he collected over his life that he thought were important enough to save. Uh, were there along with photographs and things like that. And I thought about like my own two daughters that I have, and I thought, you know, I'm probably not going to leave a box of stuff for them. I'm probably going to leave mostly data, and I'm probably going to leave a lot of data. Um, you know, as of today, I have, I don't know, something around 50,000 photos, and I might have, you know, a few thousand videos, things like that. And how is that? How do I know that they're going to be able to, to see that? Uh, and their children are going to be able to see it the same way that we took for granted um, over the years. So, you know, paper photo, it's there, it's in the box, you can pick it up, you can look at it. Um, but what about my digital photos? And so we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, now, as we start talking about data, as we start talking about data, um, well, I wish I could, I could, I could do one of my favorite things, which is to ask people by a show of hands, you know, how many people have had these formats of media. Um, so does anybody have uh, a jazz drive or a zip drive or a magneto optical drive? Um, you know, these are all formats that, uh, that I certainly grew up with. Um, and the, the problem with these things, if you store your data on them is 
the device becomes obsolete. Um, so, you know, uh, jazz drives and, and, you know, at some point in time, we've all used, um, you know, this type of media and, um, and it, it gets to a point where the, the, the new machines that we buy either don't have the interface that will support that uh, device uh, or they just don't con don't have the device at all, which is the case of um, CD and DVD-ROMs. And so, you know, um, one of the things that is a danger to, you know, our data is that we store them on media that becomes obsolete. The other thing that 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 happens is, you know, the 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 media the the data is still around. You've moved it from one media to another, but the file format that you stored it in becomes obsolete. Now, how many times have has this happened? You know, where you change machines and you wanted to open something and you couldn't because the application wasn't there or worse, the application that you use to create it won't open it because the file format uh, is too old. And that's what we call format obsolescence. Um, so, you know, your data is good. It's readable, but you just don't have an application that can read it. And for all intents and purposes, that data is lost. So I'm going to talk about these two types of. Um, barriers that can prevent you from being able to pass on your data um, you know, to your kids and, and to the next generation. And so I'll talk a little bit more about uh, 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 media obsolescence. Now, how many people here still have um, important files or things that they've, that, that, that they've backed up to either CD or DVD-ROM? And I guess I'll do kind of a virtual show of things, but I'm sure uh, a lot of you probably do. And I certainly did too. Um, you know, before I started the company that I'm in now, uh, I had worked for a, a an entertainment technology company called Macrovision, and then it changed to Rovi, and now it's TiVo. Uh, but we worked with optical media a lot. And one of the things that we found was that, you know, optical media, especially um, DVD ROM and DVD-R drives, that format was supposed to last 50 to 100 years. Um, and it turns out that's not necessarily the case. And I'll explain to you um, what happens with that media and why you should probably try to avoid using um, this and, and move over to a more reliable format if you can. Now, um, a, a, a CDR or a DVD-R basically has three major little components uh, that's built into one of these discs. There's a label, there's an organic dye, and then there is this layer of polycarbonate substrate. And the way your data gets written onto this media is that a laser will shine through the polycarbonate and it will actually uh, burn through to the organic dye with the laser and it will expose that sector and that becomes either the one or the zero very much like a, a stamped disc will have pits in it and that allows the the reader to just to, to know what kind of data is written to it well you know what could go wrong in this situation well over time the the organic dye that is either exposed or not exposed for each sec for each sector can actually leach into some of the other sectors and in that case it'll make that particular file not readable or in a worst case scenario, it will make the whole disk not readable. Um, there's other problems like oxidization, um, that you know, small cracks that can appear uh, in the substrate and it gets oxidized and that will also um, cause the sectors to read. And so I learned a long time ago that this media that I had once anticipated as being something that I was gonna be able to pass down and you know, it would last 50 to 100 years, tended not to be that reliable. And so one of the things I did personally was I went through, you know, hundreds of um, discs that I burned and I moved them all to um, to a, a real hard drive. And so that was a lesson that I had learned early on. Now, this doesn't mean that this is going to happen to every disc and it's going to happen to you, but this is certainly something that um, that has happened a lot, and it's it's something that you should um, you should think about. Um, this is the this is one of the rules that I always tell people um, about um, fighting media obsolescence is always have a backup 
on contemporary formats. So for me personally, and I'm a software developer and I've got lots of source code everywhere. Um, one of the things that I do is I make sure that I ha always have three complete backups. Now, why do I have three complete backups? Well, sometimes, um, you know, when you have three backups, you have three different versions of it that are spread out over time. And I've had situations where um, I had to go back to a backup prior to the one that I had used because I didn't know that something got deleted from it. And so having three separate backups that are spread out over time will help you if you need to really go back to something where you might have overwritten some data um, inadvertently. And I always try to keep it on at least two different contemporary formats. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, obviously I don't keep them on jazz drives or zip drives or magneto opticals. Um, for now, uh, a contemporary format for me is something like this. I don't know if you guys can see these, but this is a, an SSD drive. It's, it's USB-C. Um, it's very small. It's very fast. Um, it mounts, you know, on my, uh, my MacBook and it's, it's, it, it, it's a very high transfer rate. And, um, I generally have three of these that I keep my backups on. Um, and I will, uh, take one of these and I'll, I'll take it to my wife's parents' house in Placerville, uh, and I'll just leave one there. And so I've got an offsite backup, uh, in case my house burns down or my office burns down, you know, I've got a, a, another copy and, and these drives are actually. Um, pretty affordable. So on Amazon, you can get an SSD that's about um, 500 gigs for about 50 bucks. And this particular case is about $20 uh, and it makes a very good backup. And if you want to go for something a little bit larger, I can open this thing up so you can see what this looks like. Um, but this is a, a terabyte drive. And again, it uses the same type of thing. It uses a, uh, an SSD inside this little case and it closes up and it's got a nice heat sink around it. Uh, and then it's got a USB um, C interface on it, and this can go pretty much wherever. Um, but I generally use these for for back. M1 MacBook that I have right here only has a 500 gig drive, so I can clone that. So generally, what I do is I'll use a Carbon Cloner. I'll clone it on here, and then this is a uh, a one terabyte drive, and this is where I can put some of my other data on. And these have have worked um, very well for me. So. Um, so a contemporary format, that's really important. Um, so I, I don't, um, I don't back up. I've got, I've, I put a little picture in here of this. Um, you know, I go to trade shows a lot and they always want to give me a, um, a USB dongle or USB key. And I always, um, uh, accept them graciously and then throw them away. Um, because these are generally, you know, the lowest form of, um, of media that you can get usually by the lowest vendor. So, you know, so, so you might say, okay, yeah, I'm with you on these. I won't ever use these, but, you know, maybe I'll put my, my data on a USB key. I generally try to avoid that if I can and go right to hard drive. Um, a, because it's faster and B it's, it's so much more reliable. Um, so that's where I get into this avoid sort of the removable media. Now I say that, but you know, you could say this is removable too. Yes, it is. Um, but it's uh, a lot more trustworthy. So I never back up to any recordable media anymore. Uh, and I don't, I don't back up to low cost or free media. Everybody with me so far. Okay. So now we're going to talk about format obsolescence, right? This is, this is where, you know, the data that you have now, this has happened to me a lot. So I got my 1st computer in 1994. It was very expensive. I think it was like $2,500. Uh, and I started putting my files on it. And over time, as I got a new uh, PowerBook, I would copy my old data off, uh, you know, and, and, and it would sort of water flow. Um, and it turned out that um, 10 or 15 years later, when I tried to open a file, like, oh, I wanna open up that paper that I wrote uh, at De Anza College when I was a student there, and it was so great, let me open it. Uh, I can't anymore. Um, and does anybody know why um, you can't open a file. What are, what are some of the reasons for not being able to open a file when the data is intact? Well, um, this happens because most file formats, especially things like Word and Excel, um, you know, PageMaker, these programs that um, you create data in, well, these file formats, you might have been typing things into it in text, and you can say, well, I should be able to open this forever. It's just text after all. 
Well, these programs have object code that gets injected into the file format. Um, so this is a text code, this is object code. The program is actually injecting that in there. And that's the thing that makes it obsolete because um, even if that program is still around, um, the file format changes over time. So think about, um, you know, maybe you had a document in Microsoft Word from the 90s. Well, will it still open today if you have the very latest version of Microsoft Word? Well, chances are, and I actually know this because I have tons of files that, that couldn't open with the most recent version, um, is because the developers have added new features and they've changed the file format and they're not going to continue to support each original file format indefinitely. And so, you know, just sort of as a general rule, uh, a lot of software developers will only go back two or three versions before they say, sorry, I can't, I can't open this. Or you'll get a message like that, where you see on that screenshot where it just gives you a cryptic message like, hey, I can't open it right now. Um, and so um, format obsolescence is a function of, you know, newer versions of software not being able to open um, what you had. And there are certainly things that you can do to prevent this from happening. Now, when I go back and I look at files that I've had for 25, 30 years, which ones do you think were the ones that were, um, that I could open and which ones couldn't I? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Probably I'll, I'll, I'll keep, text I won't keep you in too much. This PDF. Say, say that, that again. Text files or PDF. Does so it... there was no PDF back then. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, one of my first engineering jobs was uh, a, a Mac software company called No Hand Software. And they had a competitor to PDF. So, so I, I remember this pretty well. Um, is there was a program called Common Ground. And it was supposed to be this um, e-fax type software. So, so PDF just started um, being developed sort of in the mid to late 90s. Um, and oddly, some of the original PDFs that you have cannot be open today. So even the, the original file format from back when Adobe um, first developed it are, are not. So back to my original question, which ones was I able to open and which ones was I not? There was one thing in common with all the, the files that I was able to open, and that was they were a text-based format. Does that make sense? So uh, Microsoft Word, Word files, I could not open. Um, FileMaker Pro, um, Claris Works, all those kind of things. They just stopped working, and I had to do a lot of real work to get the data out of it. And I could tell you really quickly what I had to do is I had to sort of emulate um, a an old Mac and then reinstall the software that uh, the data was originally written in the same version and then I was able to open it in this sort of emulation and then convert it into a text-based format. So um, text-based formats always work. Um, you know, my original Microsoft Word files and Microsoft Works files would not open with the latest versions of Word, but um, there are some open source software um, particularly something called LibreOffice, um, which is able to open many more um, versions of software than either Pages or Word uh, can open. And the reason for that is they have a sort of they have a they have a different interest than Microsoft has or Apple has. Their interest is to get you to use that open source software, and so they don't have any particular barrier to supporting older file formats. And so Oftentimes, if, if some of you run out and you say, well, let me, let me uh, think about what Tony was doing. Well, let me try to open this Microsoft Word file from 15 years ago. And if you find that you're not able to, try to open it in something like an open source office software like LibreOffice, and you might find that it will open. So um, does anybody here maintain a family tree? Anyone? Uh, I, you know, I actually can't see how many of you are saying yes or no, um, but I'll assume some of you have. I certainly do. Uh, family tree software is like the prime candidate for format obsolescence because they often use a proprietary format and the database is actually built into that format. And as they change that file format, the older, ver the, the 
the newer versions cannot open the older versions of the software. And, you know, think about that, what, what that means. That means you spent all this time researching your family and finding notes and figuring out where your, your family tree is. And, you know, a generation from now, when somebody finds that file, they won't be able to open it. Um, and so, so one of the things that you can do to protect yourself, if you use family tree software, and I use them all the time, and they're great, but what I often do is after I've done a lot of research, I will make a backup um, called a JEDCOM file, which is a text-based backup of all the data that I created. So if I did some research and I pulled in information from different sources about how, who, when my relatives were born, where they were born, who they married, when they got married, um, that information um, is in this proprietary format, but generally most family tree software will allow you to back up your data to either a PDF or a JETCOM file. And I tend to find that as soon as I do a bunch of work, I will output that right away just so that um, I can keep that data around um, for my kids and their kids. That all make sense? Okay, so one other thing I wanna talk about um, is, well, maybe you bought into this idea that um, maybe it's not such a good idea to keep your data in proprietary formats, well, what format should you put it into? Um, so I thought about this a long time ago. And, you know, a few years ago, I decided that I was going to go through every file that I had, all the data that I created, and I would take a look at it and I could, and I would say, you know, is this in a standards-based format or is it a proprietary format? And if it was in a proprietary format, did I need to keep it that way? Or should I move it to something else? And so that's one of the considerations that I make is, and we'll talk about what some of these standard formats are, but that was one of the first things uh, that I thought about. Um, the second thing is, um, so let's say I, I've got some, some data and it's in a proprietary format and it's gotta stay that way. Well, um, does, it, does it allow me to have any exportability? Um, and so as a software developer, I use a program called Sketch all the time. It's for creating user interfaces. Um, but it has the option of saving all of my work into a format called SVG, uh, and that is an open standard. And so, um, so I started saving a lot of my um, diagrams and things like that into a format like that. And so I, I'm not saying that a proprietary format is necessarily bad, but um, if it keeps you locked in and you've got to keep maintaining it, then it might be useful to have an exported version that is in a standards format uh, that will allow you to then to move that data around. The other thing I, I would uh, sort of advise on is, is sort of avoid some assumptions like, um, you know, uh, that others might care for your data more than you do. And so, you know, I, as a, as a, as a product of the business that I'm in, I go to a lot of trade shows and see a lot of people. And a lot of people say, well, I don't keep my photos around because they're all in Facebook or they're in family tree or they're in some software. Uh, and I don't have to worry about it because it's going to be there forever. Um, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily true. I've seen a lot of cases where, um, you know, early in my career, I used to work for Kodak as well. And Kodak had a, um, a they bought a company called Ophoto and people would put lots and lots of their photos onto the site and they would print some of them. Uh, but then they would assume that those photos were going to stay there forever and invariably they do not. And so, you know, my basic philosophy is that, uh, that your data is your problem and, and um, you have to maintain it to the best of your abilities if it's important to you, okay? Um, so this is what I do uh, generally. And, and one of the things that I look at is, um, you know, do I have any audio then it's, that's in the format other than one of these three? And if it's in one of those, if it's not in one of those three formats, then I change it. And these are FLAC, AAC, and MP3. Now, audio is is pretty, it's it's a pretty easy one to have most of your um, uh, data in now. But a, a while ago, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, there were other formats. And so one of the things that I did was I uh, moved them into one of these standards-based formats and I don't have any audio that's not in one of those three. Um, the other thing is all of my images 
are either JPEGs, TIFFs, or PNG. Uh, and I sh and this, this slide is a little old because, as you know, some of the newer iPhones uh, will uh, write their image files into a format called HEEK or HEEF. Um, and that is also a, a standards-based format. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would add to that on the list. But, um, you know, I used to have some images that were in .pic format, right? Uh, or I had um, images that were uh, in, in other proprietary formats. So, so definitely one of the things I did was move them out of that format into one of these standards. Uh, and the idea behind going towards these standards is a standard is something that you've got some um, confidence will will last, um, you know, 50 to 100 years. And by putting your content into one of these formats, you have a much higher likelihood of your photos being found, your video and audio and these types of things being found. Um, the other thing that I do is I don't keep any of my documents in any format other than these these four um, PDF text HTML and markdown and I'll, I'll show you what I did to convert these so I, I literally have almost no uh, Microsoft Word documents I have almost no pages documents uh, if I write a document it'll generally be in markdown and I'll show you um, how this ends up being actually a benefit for me uh, and then finally um, you know, video format is really easy. There seems to be just one standard, uh, and that's MP4, which is the old, um, you know, is, it, it is the format that QuickTime was based on. I, as, and as a former QuickTime engineer, I don't keep any of my video files in QuickTime format at all. Uh, what's the reason for that? Well, it turns out that uh, the newest versions of QuickTime don't support some of the old codecs. So uh, things like Cinepak and some of the early stuff that I worked on, if you try to open them today, they won't open. And so for me, finding all of my QuickTime movies and transcoding them when I had the ability to do it meant that I wouldn't get into a situation where I tried to open a movie file and it wouldn't open. And so I keep everything strictly in MP4 format. Um, you know, even stuff that I, I shoot today on my iPhone, it's it's in .mov format. I will encode it and, and move it to MP4, and then I know my kids will be able to enjoy that. Okay. Um, now, uh, some tips on how to make your data um, live long and prosper. Okay? <laughs> I'm a Star Trek fan. So one of the things that I did at the very beginning when I embarked on this is I is centralize your data into one specific place. And so the Mac makes it kind of easy to do this um, because you've got your user directory, but I go a little further and I put everything into one specific place. And for me, um, that's Dropbox because I know it's that one folder that I can pick up and drop onto a, um, a backup drive. And once that backup is made, I know that all of my data has been moved over there. The other thing that I did, and I shared part of this, is I do what's called a data audit. So a few years ago, I went back and I said, can I open this file? Can I open that file? Um, even if I didn't need to get to it, but if I couldn't open it, you know, 10 years ago, my kids aren't going to be able to open it 20 years from now. And so doing this audit sort of helps you uh, figure out um, what files you need to think about moving to a standards-based format. Um, the other thing I looked at is, um, you know, not all the data that you have is necessarily high value, super important stuff. But for me as a father, um, you know, my the movies and the photos and the other things, you know, my, my, my parents entrusted me with all of our family history. And so I've got it and I'm going to give it to my kids and my kids are going to you know, create their own data and they're going to pass it on to their kids. And so for me, passing this on in a standards based way means that um, my virtual box of stuff that I give my kids is going to be something that they can enjoy. Um, the other thing I looked at was, am I using something that my data is tied to that could go away and and then 
not make it accessible to my children. So, for example, I'd set it that I use Dropbox. Um, you know, I've got a backup of everything that's in my Dropbox. So, if something happens to that web service, um, you know, it, 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 my content isn't going to go away. Um, I also think about, am I relying on a service, you know, that might be free, but what if suddenly somebody says, well, we're going to stop supporting that. Um, and this happens a lot. It happens more than you might think. So I rely on a service called uh, Google Voice. Um, I use Gmail a lot. And so one of the things that I do is I will once every six months do what's called a Google takeout and every, all of the data um, that they have that's mine, I download it and it is already in a standard based format and then I'll add that to my data. So for example, on a day-to-day -day basis, I will use Apple Mail to you know, do all of my email, but then I will also export out all of my uh, email into a what's called an inbox format and that format then gets um, stored along with all of my other data. Um, and then, you know, if, if my kids later on uh, want to read my email and find it interesting, they'll be able to do it. Um, oh, here's another one that I think is good. Um, I, I get this all the time. Um, are you using a web service that downgrades your photos? So I know a lot of people that um, that say, well, I uploaded my uh, my, my kids' photos onto Facebook and it's there and I can see it, uh, but they don't realize that that, uh, that image that they uploaded uh, was shrunk down and is small and it's great for Facebook, but it's not great for you or your kids. And so, you know, again, this is that, that thing that I say, which is, um, you know, your data is your responsibility. It's not somebody else's responsibility to maintain it. And so while I do post things on Facebook and other places, I always keep a master copy of my data uh, and then everything else is uh, more or less a satellite. Uh, and so for me, this last point is not relevant, but if it is relevant to you, then you might think, well, you know, where is my master copy of this? Um, and, and how do I back it up and make sure that, that it, it translates into the future? Okay, so um, this is what I do for myself. This is, this is called centralizing data. And so I've got, if you looked on my uh, Dropbox, um, you would see, you know, a, a folder called photos, another one called video, documents, music, audio, and miscellaneous files. And again, these are put in generalized category. My kids know, all know, hey, this is where all of our movies and child and home, home movies are. The photos are all in here. And so it's organized in such a way that uh, when I pass it on to them, they'll understand what it means and it's, it's centralized in a logical way. And so think about this for a moment, right? So we're doing this um, physical to digital transformation. You know, we've gone from a, a time when, you know, our great grandparents and our parents and our, you know, aunts and uncles, they all passed physical things. Maybe we scan them, maybe we store them in other ways very likely that in the future, um, the, the digital equivalent to these boxes of things will be data. And what happens to data when it accumulates? Well, um, it, it becomes a folder and a folder and a folder and a folder. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that I do is make sure that all of my data, most of my data is searchable so that when my kids and, and their grandchildren look at the data, not only do they have the you know, the, the volume of that data, but it's, it's relevant in terms of being able to search for and find the specific things that give them relevance. Because again, it's not a box anymore. It's not like, here's my dad's stuff and it, I can look in that box. And by the time I get to the end of the box, that's the end of it. Well, data is not like that. It can be endless and it can be, you know, nested very deeply in, into folders. And so having it organized well and searchable uh, is is important. Um, here's another view of how I store my photos. So I store my photos based by the year the photo was taken. And then over here, I, um, you know, inside each one of these folders, they're organized by the month. And then each photo is renamed based on the day that it was taken. And a little bit more on this later, but this is kind of structured in a way that makes it pretty logical and pretty easy for 
you know, for my kids or whoever I pass these on to, to kind of understand how it works as opposed to, um, you know, a, a folder that says grandma's wedding or summer vacation or something like that. Um, what I do is I make sure that I, I tag every photo so that um, they can go on the top level of this. They can search across all of it and be able to find the specific things that they're looking for. Um, the other thing that I would advise is um, consider how your data is going to be used in the future. And that's something that, uh, again, requires a little forward thinking. So, you know, who's going to get my content? How are they going to use it? Uh, is it my music? Is it videos? Is it, you know, childhood things? Um, and, and, and once you sort of think about how it's going to be used in the future, it will help you determine, you know, if you need to convert it and what to convert it to. Um, so file format for the future, um, as I told you before, I, I am almost exclusively in, uh, Markdown now. And I know that a, a couple of months ago, you had somebody, com uh, somebody present that, um, that presented obsidian. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a great program and I want to show you what I was doing before that presentation. So I used to use a program called Ulysses. I'm just going to show you my own sort of, um, this, this is my, th these are all the documents that I have pretty much for my whole life, right? Business writings, um, you know, I can go in here and I can find, um, you know, term papers that I wrote when I was at Berkeley, um, right? So it's all, it's all right here. It's all searchable. Um, and if I go to my iPhone, let me show you what that looks like here is this is my iPhone and because it's in this text-based format, right? I can use any program that understands how to read Markdown so I can quickly find all of my documents. So, you know, if I'm out and about and I wanna find, um, you know, something that I had written in the past, it's all right here. And uh, when I started learning about Obsidian, because it's based on an open standard, which is Markdown, I was able to simply just open that, that program, point it to my folder, and everything just showed up again, right? So because I'm using an open standard, I don't have to worry about file formats. Um, I, can, I can move my data from one program to the next without really having any, any worries about compatibility. Does that all make sense? I'll assume that, that, that you mean yes. Uh, silence means yes to me at this point. Um, so that's Obsidian. Um, let me go back to our presentation. Um, the last point that I wanna make, and I've kind of made this point a little bit earlier, which is, you know, it's important to, you know, if you care about your data and who you're passing it on to, it's important to organize it well, it's important to put it into standards, but it's also important to make it searchable. Um, and so how many of you used, uh, I, use iTunes or have used iTunes in the past or Apple Music, right? Uh, probably most of you. Uh, some of you probably ripped your old CDs into iTunes. Now, imagine what would happen if you ripped a CD to iTunes and, um, and there was no metadata on any of those songs. Maybe it, what if there wasn't a service that, that would convert what that CD was so that it would label the artist and the, and the, the title uh, for you. Well, then you would have a, you know, a hard drive full of music that said unknown album, unknown artist, unknown song. Uh, but the fact is that's not how it works. All of this data is tagged for us almost automatically and we are able to search for the music that we want instantly, right? It's just, we don't even think about it. But now think about your own photos and your own videos and maybe audio notes that you that you've taken if those pieces of data are not tagged then your your current operating system and the next operating systems will identify them as being images but they don't know what's inside them and so you know your most important content should be searchable and what that means is tag your photos tag your video and tag your audio so that inside that file format also includes some data that your kids or grandchildren can type uh, and be able to find their content 
uh, quickly. And so I'm going to do just a quick little experiment here, which is, you know, I have about 50,000 photos. I've been taking photos my whole life. And um, if you had asked me, um, hey, Tony, find me a photo of one of your daughters in Paris. Well, this is all I would have to do. Um, I would, uh, you know, go in here in Spotlight and I would say, well, I know it's an image. And I know it's on my hard drive and I know my daughter's name is Lucia. And I know that the photos that I'm looking at. Right? So, you know, very quickly, I'm able to find. You know, just the 100 or so 144 images that were in Paris. Well, I have another daughter and her name is Izzy. And so with all photos of just her in Paris, I can find those 79. And so once your content has these metadata tags in them, whether they're photos, whether they're video, whether they're audio, they become very easy to find. Now, if I didn't do this, then it would be much harder to get this level of granularity where I can take these 50,000 photos and then boil them down to just the ones that I care about at that moment or if I want to share them. And so that's why uh, you know, creating the metadata for your for your content is important. Anything else? Well, let's see. Let's so go back here. And does anybody have any questions I can answer up to this point? Uh, just type your questions into the chat box. Oh gosh, I'm going to have to. I have to figure out where the chat box is on the WebEx. <laughs> Uh, feel free to shout out if you want. Okay. A question concerning making those upgrades. Um, a lot of the transitions between file formats don't necessarily keep the original quality, uh, videos especially. Okay, so uh, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, so I, if nothing else, I'm a pragmatic person, okay? So, um, each person has their own sort of view on what quality is. Uh, and so I certainly don't want to make any quality qualitative. You should do it this way. You should do it that way. But I can actually sh show you some things um, about what I do, right? So here's my photo library. It's 66 gigabytes, right? It could very easily be three, four times more than that, right? So, um, you know, if, if I took a digital SLR and I clicked on the shutter, it might produce a five or six megabyte file, or I could take my iPhone and take some 4K video and I could end up with a gigabyte file. Uh, and so, you know, I have the, the benefit of having, you know, I'm a software developer and I spent most of my career in multimedia and imaging. And so for me personally, what I did is I said, there has to be a trade off between file size and quality. And so for me, you know, I, I pick, you know, a quality level that I think is going to work for me now and for my children in the future. And that's not necessarily uh, the thing that comes out of the camera when I hit record. And so, you know, I've got a background in uh, photo image compression and video compression. And so I'll re-encode my videos if they um, achieve my goal of keeping my data at a reasonable size. And so I'm not somebody that keeps um, a, a video that's 100 megabits when I can encode it with H.265 where it's 6 megabits and is visually indistinguishable from the original. And so for me, I like to add a little pragmatism to it. I know that those are, there are people who are like, nope, I've got to keep every bit of data that came out of that camera or, or wherever, and all my music has to be lossless, and that's fine. Um, but, uh, but as I said, I could very really easily have terabytes more data than I have right now. And, and the problem with that is it becomes a burden to transfer, transport from place to place. And so I try to find that happy middle. Does that does that answer your question? 
In many ways, yes. Um, one of the too bad. I, I was, was going to say silence means yes <laughs> before you came on. Um, yeah, but but um, yeah, I I I understand. Uh, I'm sorry. Keep going. Interrupt. Interrupt. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is if you have to make more than one transition with these sort of materials, that you can very quickly end up with a case that steadily degrades the quality of um, your items. And okay, so, so this, there might this be an advantage in these cases to keeping the original um, along with your converted copy. Yeah, I've heard this um, this idea a lot. Uh, in fact, it comes up in my genealogy group quite a bit because you know we're used to we come from a generation where if you copy the VCR too many times, it looked like crap at the end. Uh, that doesn't necessarily work that way with with. Um, with digital, and, and this is something called uh, quantification. Okay, and so, for example, um, you know, there's this myth where if you take a JPEG image and you edit it too many times, then it ends up looking terrible. When in actuality, that's not really true. Um, uh, yes, the, when you take a, a JPEG image that came straight from the camera and you uh, requantize it, uh, and sometimes you can do that just by getting rid of red eye. Um, then you bring it down to a specific quality level. But if you re-edit it again, what happens is, is the whatever program is 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 um, being used to edit it will decode it completely. And then when you go to save it, it'll use the same compression setting that you used before. And so this idea of generational loss in the digital world isn't, in my opinion, it's not real. It's not something that you should worry about. That's not to say that you shouldn't keep, I, I do, Okay, sometimes I shoot raw and I keep raw images around, um, you know, because there's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a practical reason for that, right? I might wanna go back to that original image at full quality and re-edit it. Whereas if I took the JPEG image, I've, I've lost a lot of headroom and, you know, and, and I can't get that back. And so, you know, this is the type of thing, and by the way, that's an ex this is an excellent question. It's something that you have to feel comfortable with. I can't tell you, no, do it this way because I do it that way and I, I feel great about it. I think everybody has to sort of decide on their own. But for me, I had to achieve a balance between, you know, how much data I was carrying versus the level of quality. And I found sort of a zone that I'm happy with. That makes sense? Okay. Good so, thanks. thank you. Uh, last thing I want to share with you guys is, okay, so I showed you how I organize my data, right? So I want to show you one of the products that we've been working on, which we're going to release in, you know, about a week, week and a half. And this is a program called ChromaDrop. And what ChromaDrop does is it allows you to take photos. So, you know, I have this notion of a master folder, right? So I've shown you, a, you know, a copy of it, right? So this is, you know, all of my, you know, every DVD or every movie that I've ever had goes in here and all of our home videos, they all go in here. And the same sort of nomenclature I use for my photos, right? So I, I maintain this, this, um, this, this tree of sorts, right? So I can sort it and I can see all the photos that I have. And so this is my master folder. And ChromaDrop is effectively a tool that uh, that you can use to create this master folder full of um, of a starter on how you you uh, organize your photos. And so I'm going to show you really quickly how this works. So ChromaDrop allows you to create this master folder. I'm going to get rid of the master folder that we have here. And the first thing you do is you assign it this folder, and this is the folder that it's gonna create the tree for. And then you can take your images, and however, you, however way you have them. This is an example of um, some loose um, images that I might have. Um, you know, I download stuff a lot for nostalgic reasons, right? So I might feel nostalgic about uh, the old San Jose airport or the Orchard Supply hardware sign, or maybe the soon to be uh, uh, torn down uh, Western appliance. And so I, you know, I have this nostalgic streak in me. And so what 
uh, from a drop is going to do is it's going to allow me to just take this folder, drop it on here, and it's going to either copy or move all of these images into this master folder, and then it will generate this uh, this structure, which then organizes all my photos into this tree. And it can also rename all of your images based on the date that they were taken. So when you use your camera, uh, it might say IMG 4012, and there's all these collisions. And so again, I, I prefer to keep my images, uh, the file names, um, relevant to when they were taken. So this photo was taken, you know, in May, and it was taken at 1.12 uh, p.m. And if I look at it, yeah, that looks about <laughs> like one in the afternoon, right? So I create this tree structure. And if you go back to this little interface, after it's done copying or moving these images, it'll say, you know, I've moved this many images or I've copied these into your tree, and 37 of them don't contain any uh, date. And so one of the ways that, one of the things that this program does is it reads the internal date for when the photo was taken. And if it doesn't have an internal date, then it will move them into an undated folder, right? And so these all have their original file dates on them, but they don't have any internal dates. And we have another program, which is a photo metadata tagging program called Chromatag. And if I open this up, one of the new features in this newest version that we have that's coming out in about a week is it shows you this master folder. And if you open it up, um, the very first thing you see on top of it is the undated folder. And so this will allow me now to see which images um, are missing the date and they're all missing the date, right? Um, and I can go in here and I can say, hey, these photos were taken in the summer of 1974, right? Uh, 74, okay. And when I tag them, um, they'll get tagged and then they'll get moved into the proper directory in the tree. So there they are now, and now they have, you know, the right, the, the right metadata and they get uh, installed in the correct place. And now I can go through all of these other images that are, that are not tagged. I can tag them, I can geotag them, and they will go into the proper place. Does that all make sense? So that's a, that's just a quick look at the two programs that we are working on. Uh, Chromatag is going to be, uh, updated, uh, later this week and Chromadrop will, um, be released by next Friday, I would say. Um, you have any questions? Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, is there, is this kind of an either or with uh, Apple Photos, or is this kind of coexist with Photos? It's hard to kind of get away from Photos when you're taking pictures with iPhones and stuff. So, so true to my uh, sort of <laughs> um, agnostic. So, I use Apple Photos, okay, um, but. I don't use that as my main copy. So I, I basically maintain two photo libraries, right? And the reason that I use Apple Photos is I'll show you. Um, so here's my photo library, right? So what Apple Photos gets, gets me is I can take this phone or this iPad wherever I want. And, you know, I can find, you know, uh, it indexes all the metadata, all the work that I did to create the metadata, it indexes for me. And so, I can pick up my phone and I can say, I want to see photos of Izzy. Uh, and it says, like, if you look here at the top, I've got 13,000 photos of my first daughter. And if I want to see the photos of her in Paris, I type that in and now I can see them all. And so because I've tagged all of these, it's the one program, it's better than uh, Google Photos, it's better than Amazon, because it allows me to, um, to, to find all my photos very quickly and I can share them quickly. And so I use uh, Apple Photos for that reason, but there's a downside to Apple Photos, which is it takes complete control over your photos. It's a closed system. Um, you know, if, if something happened to me and my kids couldn't get into my computer or something happened to my Apple account and I got locked out, it's a closed system. 
And so what I do is I maintain an exact copy. I've got a workflow. So I, I'll take most of my photos on my iPhone. Uh, and then I will bring those photos into my master folder. Uh, where I control them and I maintain it and then I'll keep another copy in, um, in iCloud. And I routinely delete all the images um, from iCloud because they're not my important images. They're, it's a satellite. It's not the, the, the sort of master thing. Uh, and so the way these products work is they're geared towards your master folder. We don't, so neither Chroma Drop nor Chroma Tag um, works with Apple Photos um, directly, but um, it's something that we're considering for the next version of Chroma Tag. But again, our, our philosophy is it's better to maintain your own data um, and make it searchable and then bring that into wherever you want uh, to consume it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions I can answer? I'm quickly running out of time, it looks like. There's a question in chat um, that I'll just repeat. It says, do you keep paper copies? Wouldn't that be safer for important documents and photos? Do I keep paper copies? I do not. <laughs> I've scanned everything. Okay, so so if you look back in your, if I look, so, so um, all of my documents are either in markdown format or if they don't lend themselves well to markdown, then they're PDFs, right? And I have the same sort of exact structure, right, for PDFs. They're all sort of searchable, but here's diamonds. Here's my um, here's my junior high school class newspaper, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that could exist in paper form, but what are my kids going to do with that, right? Um, and that's what I always think about. Um, you know, here's my old high school physics notebook. You know, um, these things for me, they become unwieldy. And so personally, I found that scanning them and then making them searchable is much better for me and for my children than leaving them boxes of stuff that they might not know what to do with. That makes sense? I had a question. Sure. Um, I done some backup and, and not managed it very well. So the result is I've got a lot of duplicated files that, that I've kind of lost control of. So in, in your conversion, getting into a, a more manageable, let's say, database, uh, is there any provision for like eliminating duplicate files? So you have a, a standard database that, that becomes kind of your master database, but you've gotten rid of all these um, duplicate files that that, uh, so it depends on what your duplicate is. If they're actual, so there's programs that will help you find duplicates. We're not, that's not us. Right. Um, but I've, I've had that, that problem before. I actually use a program called Gemini and it works pretty well. Um, and I've taken, so this works well for photos, right? So let's just say you had a bunch of photos from a camera and you continually re-imported it. Well, uh, a, a program like Gemini will find all those duplicates for you because the data is basically the same or the metadata inside that image is the same. And so, yeah, there's programs that can help you with that. Our program could kind of help you with it if your photos are scattered all over the place and they all have metadata, then we'll move them into a single <clears throat> folder and then you might be able to then say, oh, there's three versions of that, ex that same image. Uh, you know, let me get rid of it. But um, depending on where your duplicates are and and what file format they're in, um, you know, you might be better off with a, a program like Gemini. And it's actually, you know, I use um, SetApp, which is the subscription-based Mac thing. You probably you guys are probably all aware. And it just came came with it. And I was surprised because I I thought I was good at this, right? And I found quite a few duplicates, which helped. Quite a bit, so it's it's something that even if if you're meticulous like I am, yes, you'll still have duplicates. And if you're not meticulous, you probably have a lot of duplicates. I'm not meticulous. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Any anything else before I go? Okay. Uh, so I want to thank all of you. Um, 
If you go to our website, you can find out more information about the products that I personally make. Um, I showed you the program uh, Chromatag. Uh, if you look at it and you like it uh, for the next week, um, there, there's a coupon code for 50% off. If you want to reach me in particular, go to my go to our website, uh, go to chroma.net slash support, and, and just write in there um, that you want to talk to Tony, and then I will answer you personally um, instead of putting my email address out, out to uh, the world, because since this is on YouTube, um, you can reach me this way. Um, other than that, I want to thank you. I hope that you guys have given this a little bit of thought. Um, certainly don't do everything that I did, but, um, you know, think about your data and think about, um, you know, who's going to get it um, and, 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 you know, how to pass those important things down uh, to your relatives and to your kids and to your grandkids in a way that they'll be able to enjoy. So thanks very much.